Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Well, I will uh, cut to the chase. I, I got a CT scan last week of my lymph nodes and, and thorax, and the oncologist reviewed them and some quick blood work with me yesterday and uh, confirmed that my CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, is officially stage zero. So uh, she told me to come back in six months for blood work to see if anything's changed, and if not, um, just keep doing that for the rest of my life. It was, um, it was a great relief as was getting finished with this giant financial negotiation I'm involved with at my, my day job. Um, that said, the, uh, the stress and anxiety of the last month plus is, has gotten to me pretty badly. Um, we had a confirmation call about the negotiation yesterday morning with the, the industry groups and a federal agency on, a, on Zoom. And um, the lead industry guy tried to joke that I and my constituents were accepting the opposite of, of what we had settled on. And in the maybe half second before I realized he was joking, I exploded into a tirade. Um, like in Young Frankenstein, when, when Gene Wilder goes bananas on, on Peter Boyle's body after the experiment fails to, to bring him back to life. And I realized the guy had made a joke Again, after about half a second of this, but at that point, <laughs> I was already committed to the tirade, so I, I stuck with it a few more seconds, and it's my belief that nobody on that call is ever going to make a joke around me ever again. Um, but it was also a sign that, yes, I've been a little wound up of, of late, but, but now all is good. Uh, the negotiation is pretty much wrapped up. There is a path for me to... to step down from regarding the the leukemia time bomb thing, although that's always going to be in the back of my head. And maybe I can, you know, just, just breathe a little. Uh, in the evening or late afternoon after the, the oncology meeting, I let my board of trustees know about the negotiation, the diagnosis and other stuff. And um, even they joke that it's, it's time for me to take a week or so off to... Um, I think they said decompress and recharge, whatever that's supposed to mean. Um, because that said, I, I still have to decide this week whether to sign a contract with a hotel for an in-person conference in October. And there's no real out clause unless the state of Maryland shuts everything down. And it's a prospect that I am having second thoughts about because of, of proliferation of the Delta variant of COVID-19 and whether people are going to be traveling again in October and, and, and Hey, what would my life be without all the, the anxiety inducing decisions, man? Anyway, let's get to this week's show where for the first time, I actually talked with the guest a little about my diagnosis and what it sort of portended about life changing decisions, especially around books. And that's because my guest this time is Heather Cass White, who has a wonderful new book out called Books Promiscuously Read, published by FSG. Its subtitle is Reading as a Way of Life. And over the course of like 140, 150 pages, Heather explores what it means to be a reader, especially of uh, imaginative prose and, and, and poetry. And I still occasionally describe this podcast as a conversation about books and life. So books promiscuously read was right up my alley. And if you listen to me with any regularity, I bet you'll dig this one too. Now, Heather, she, she jettisons the notion early on that reading quote unquote makes us better people. And instead she goes after more subtle notions of what we do when we're reading and and how reading can change us 
and, and make us more open to the world and ourselves, not with any guarantee of, of self-improvement or building an ethical life, et cetera, but, but getting us to, to listen and to see. And throughout the book, she gets into a, a pretty breathtaking array of literary sources, kind of like how Montaigne's essays incorporate all the, the great works he had read. But much like Montaigne, she also never, you know, the book never feels like it's pummeling you with, with erudition or anything. She integrates those thoughts into the prose in a way that conveys how they've, they've influenced her own thinking and how she reads and, and what reading has brought to her and how deeply she's ingested these, these ideas and quotes and concepts in a way that allows her to share them with the reader with confidence. Not that you have to know all the, the references, but that you can follow what they mean. And that you're willing to read more deeply. And she manages to shift between, you know, aphorism and, and deep reading modes pretty effortlessly throughout the book. And and it all means you're going to finish this with you know, with individual pearls of wisdom and an appreciation for what you can find by luxuriating in the lines of, of a good poem. Or, you know, really thinking through what a character does and, and says and means over the course of a novel. So go pick up Books Promiscuously Read, and don't call it Books Read Promiscuously, which I accidentally do once or twice during our conversation. Now, here's Heather's bio from the book. Heather Cass White has edited several collections of Marianne Moore's work, New Collected Poems, A Quiver with Significance, Marianne Moore, 1932 to 1936, and Adversity and Grace, Marianne Moore, 1936 to 1941. She is a professor of English at the University of Alabama, much to my wife's chagrin because my wife went to LSU. Her new book is Books Promiscuously Read. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Heather Cass White. Tell me about where books promiscuously read began for you. H how did it come together? And we could talk about how promiscuously works in it later on, but, sure. but where did it all start for you? Uh, I, I would say that there are at least two answers to that question. Yeah. So the immediate answer is I had finished – so I finished the Moore edition. It came out in 2017. I, I edited um, an edition of the Collected Poems of Marianne Moore. Right. And that culminated, that was the culmination of about 10 years of work on Marianne Moore because I had done two smaller editions of her work before that. So I had published these three editions culminating in those big Collected Poems. And I was finished with that in... I mean, maybe the end of 2015, you know, the way publishing works, it didn't actually sure. appear until 2017, but I was, I was done long before that. And all I knew was that I wanted to do something completely different. I, I loved editing more. I was very proud of it and happy about it. It was a wonderful opportunity, but you know, I'd, I'd had enough. And in the course of making that edition, I worked a lot with Jonathan Galassi at FSG Books because Jonathan had a strong interest in Marianne Moore. My contract was actually with Faber in the UK, and Jonathan very much wanted to publish the uh, North American edition. So we had worked together for you know maybe a year um, on getting that to happen. And so it was in the bag. It was coming out with Faber and with FSG, which was itself a long and really uncertain process. It never looked like that was going to happen. So that was also a real joyful surprise. And I would say I woke up at 3 a.m. one morning. I mean, I all but <laughs> sat bolt upright in bed and thought, you know, I have a relationship with the editor at FSG which is the press I love and revere beyond all things. So if there is ever a moment that I need to think seriously about what my dream book is, this is it. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this opportunity is not going to come twice. 
So the moment I realized that I needed to think about that, I always, I also realized that I knew what it was. I knew I wanted to write a book about reading. And more than that, I knew that I wanted it to be a slenderish book and that I wanted it to have pretty much exactly the structure that it has. I, I realized um, that it had been waiting for me. So the, the deeper answer then, of course, is I have no idea when this started, but once I started to investigate my, my computer, I discovered files going back 15, 20 years where I had just, I'd made these little notes. I, one, one file was called the book book. And I had just laid out, I don't know, a series of ideas of how you could imagine a book, like different ways you could think about what a book is. So plainly, everything suggests then that actually I've been thinking about this for decades and just didn't know it. <laughs> yeah. Whereas I have a book I've consciously avoided working on for decades. So you know, again, we're, we're, we're the flip side of this. I do have to say about Galassi, we recorded a few years ago around that novel he did with a Marianne Moore character in it. Probably I, I the um, Elizabeth Bishop oh, Elizabeth character. Elizabeth Bishop Muse. character. Yeah, that's right. The, yeah. The, yeah. Um, but my life, I've... I, been thankful I didn't pursue a career in the arts or publishing just because mm -hmm. I see what the rest of you have to deal with now. <laughs> and it was the, that moment in the, the lobby at FSG that I, I just had a moment of, yeah, I guess I could have done this instead of, you know, business you magazines. And, Come on. Ah. Well, now I, I, I play with the, well, I'm a 50 year old white man. Nobody's interested in hearing my, my opinions or thoughts at this point. Dude, I'm a 50 year old white woman. I'm right there with you. That's one of the things I meant to ask. I've been able to do virtually no research about your life. Like there's almost <laughs> nothing out there. So I had no idea from the picture. I'm like, could be 35, could be my age. I literally Aww. don't know. So thank you for clearing that up. That's, that's you a charmer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do work at it, but, but yeah, it was that moment with, with the FSG office. I'm like, wow, this is a storied publisher. This is, you know, you see all of those, those, uh, mm. the awards and the announcements on the, the walls. And I just had this, yeah, it's a road not traveled, but you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm okay with, um, being a lobbyist for the pharmaceutical industry, but anyway, that's, that's <laughs> not the bad guys, which I always tell people. And somebody actually called me out on it on Twitter a couple of days ago, but, but so empty nest syndrome is sort of a contributor, like the, the post Marianne Moore, you know, it was, I would say it was less empty nest and more a buildup that was about to burst the dam. I mean, one effect of writing about one person for 10 years is that I had been reading an endless number of other people for those same 10 years and not saying anything about them mm -hmm. in any formal way. So by the time I was done with Moore, it was just, it really felt like I was just going to burst if I didn't start talking about the universe of other things I'd been thinking about and reading about. Um, and also, when you're an editor, your job is to disappear. Yeah. yeah. You know, if, you, if you've done a really good job as an editor, no one should ever know you were there except for other editors who, because they know how many interventions editors make, will be very, <laughs> very, very picky. So you also have to leave, if I, I mean, in my opinion, if you're doing a good job, you have to leave a very, very clear record of exactly what you did so that anyone who does care can go back and see precisely what interventions you made. But basically, for most people, they're going to pick up the book and they're never going to give you a thought, and that's very much as it should be. Um. But I don't know how to put this. It's not so much that I wanted people to pay attention to me as I felt ready for a different challenge, which is risking making myself visible, putting myself at the center of the story. So with my more work, um, the reviews focused totally appropriately on Moore and on her career. And there were a handful who really understand what editing is that, that also focused on my work. Um, 
And with this book, like I say, I wanted to take a different kind of risk. I, I didn't want to essentially hide behind someone else's work. I wanted to put more of myself on the line. Um, it just required a different kind of, I mean, <laughs> these are relative terms. I'm, it's yeah. going to sound ridiculous when I say this, but it, it just re it required a different kind of courage to say, yeah. this is what I think. Here's what I've been reading and here's what I think about it. And it's, it's just me. It's just what I think. Yeah. And, and a, you do it beautifully. B, you synthesize so many other sources within it. I mean, um, in, in my deep cuts, I, I once did a, a series called Monday Morning Montaigne, where I, I literally <laughs> read an essay sequentially every week and wrote about it on, uh -huh. on the weekend and posted yeah. a new one. And so the, the Montaignean vibe of, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants, as, yeah. as we all do, um, I think the, the book does that really well, but still conveys your voice and, and who you. you are. And I could see that as a, um, again, not a vanity, but a, a sense of, of wanting to make sure your voice is there too. And instead of the way I prattle on during these podcasts, instead of letting the guest talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know, I think of it as, um, I guess there were two other things I was thinking about with this book. Uh, one was, I, I think of it as, in a funny way, repaying a kind of debt. It's like I have spent my whole life. So let's say I've been able to read for, I don't know, 45 years. Um, and I've had more or less total discretionary control for at least 40 of those. And, and it has, it has shaped my life in every way possible. And it felt like I owed it something. <laughs> it felt like, yeah. you know, it had, it had just done so much for me. It was, it was time for me to do a little bit for it. Um, and I also felt like I owed, well, this gets into a slightly different question, but, um, if you've listened to the show, you know my questions go all over the goddamn place. So feel free to <laughs> take it in your own direction. It'll save yeah, me from well, coming up with something. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna sit here and podcast promiscuously, I guess. Um, <laughs> you know, when you're a scholar for wonderful, good, solid reasons that I absolutely support, you must stay focused in a way, and you must stay. Uh, alert to and respectful of the conversation in which you're joining. And you have to do certain kinds of research. And all of that, I really, I mean, obviously, I've made my life doing it. I believe in it. And I love it. But when you're a reader, that's really not how it works. That's you don't owe anybody anything like that. And um having made my life as a literary professional, I find myself, it's a curious bind. And I'm pretty sure that any professional who turns their avocation into their vocation has some version of it where I'm incredibly lucky. I'm incredibly grateful that I have a job that basically lets me do what I would be doing anyway which is to say read books. Uh, but on the other hand, because it's both my job and my pleasure, it's very easy to forget how to draw that line, um, forget how to distinguish the me that got into this because I was just an obsessive reader from the me who is a working professional, who has a pretty rigorous set of standards I need to meet if I want to be a member of my profession if I want to be responsible to it, which I absolutely do. So this book was a way of exploring, I would say, the roots of what has fed my professional life all these years, which is not actually a passion for scholarship. I mean, I didn't become an English professor because, um, oh, I don't know, because I one of the archives. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Sitting in moldy libraries. Not that I mind it, but that's not what it was about. It was it was about reading. So I needed to, for my own reasons, um, take a look at where it all started. Uh, 
and also being a reader, it's, it's in some ways a fundamentally lonely pursuit. Lonely is the wrong word. It's, it's a solitary pursuit. Yeah. yeah. And I really, really like people. <laughs> I, really, <laughs> I love people. So this was also a way of trying to make contact, you know, trying to reach other people who've had this experience. I, I, I think of it as I, I wasn't, I wasn't writing the book because I thought I had a unique experience of reading, or I thought my experience of reading was unique in the way that every other person's is unique. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I wanted to, uh, I wanted to say something that in which other people could recognize themselves and that would in some, I don't even know how to say like indirect way, put us in touch. Um, it was just my way of uh, saying, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. This is what it's like for me. I'm fairly sure that you're out there and that it's like that for you too. Hmm. So let's find each other. You know, when I, I described the book to somebody this morning, it was, oh my God, that sounds perfect for me. I'm like, and then you should pick <laughs> this up because uh, again, I, I always had the, your mileage may vary, but you know, me compulsive read. If you saw the library I'm sitting in right now, where I, I, I <laughs> built, you know, for my entire downstairs, got converted, God, ten years ago now. Um, it's my office, which always freaks people out in the day job when we do Zoom conversations uh -huh. <laughs> because they're they want to talk pharmaceuticals and then they see just books upon books right. upon books in every direction. I'm like, you don't even see what's behind the camera. That's what's <laughs> so great. I'm actually in the middle of the room and you can't even see all this. But, but yeah, it's. Um, that sense of, of, well, communitas, as you, you put it, yes, that, that, right, that right. thing where we're, you know, we have this community, but we're also part of this other. And, and I think, you know, another problem that you just sort of gestured at indirectly with your. No, I, was, your... I was literally gesturing, actually. If you could have seen me on video, <laughs> I had the hand in the air. See, we, don't, we don't need video. I know what's yeah. going on. <laughs> another problem is that if what you're devoted to is books and I would say doubly so if you have burdened your own name with degrees like MA and PhD is it, it, people find it off-putting or intimidating or you know they can make certain assumptions about what drives you and how you are in turn looking at them so that I mean a lot of people seeing a wall of books, their first response, I mean, and, and you know, if they're not themselves obsessive readers, their first response is something like, uh oh, better watch what I say, or, oh, I'm going to be judged because I haven't read any of those books. Um, oh, you, you goofed on the fact that I'm one of those recognitions people. Who <laughs> <laughs> my 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 big work i went to, to hampshire college so you can't really call it work but but my big uh uh you know end of of four years of whatever it was was a study of the encyclopedic novel mm. and i'm looking back convinced i did that solely because everybody else would be intimidated by those books and wouldn't <laughs> yeah. ask me about them so, and it worked Absolutely. worked pretty well so. yeah i can only ask you about the first half of the recognitions because that's as far as i got well i made um, it through that but i didn't read jr so you know, uh, that's, that's, you know i absolve you of reading jr i think that's fine yeah. but anyway it's it's you know that saddens me a lot because in fact so far as I'm aware, I don't judge anybody at all on the basis of what they read. Like That's just yeah. not a category for me of, of judgment of, of person. Um, I do not care, you know, whether they use perfect standard American television English. Like none of those things are true of me, again, as far as I'm self-aware of this stuff. But do you, um, when you see the books on someone's shelf, do you, you sort of think about how to accommodate conversation around that? You mean when I see somebody else's shelf? Yeah, which of course we all do when we go to someone's place and judge them based on the stuff on the shelves. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, uh, when, yeah, when we look around somebody's home. <laughs> I, I, it's, I don't know that I judge them. I really, um, I mean, I don't like, first of all, I don't want to sound like I think I'm any better than I am. I am just as petty and competitive and judgmental as the next person. So, You're in right, academia. You know, so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like, I, I'm, I'm not trying to hold myself up here as any sort of moral exemplar. Um, 
But, you know, if I go to somebody's house and I see a wall of books that are not my thing, you know, that suggests that when they pick up a book and when I pick up a book, we're looking for different things. I don't, I don't know how to put it. It's not like I say, oh, you're crossed off a list. It's more just like, I think, okay, well, so there's going to be some other way that we yeah. connect. That's probably not going to Yeah, that's be all it. I mean. Yeah. In terms of framing conversation, sure. you'd say, yeah, oh, absolutely. okay, they have this sort of book on the shelf. This is, you know, not. Yeah, but a hundred percent. I mean, you know, if yeah. I walk into somebody's house and I see a whole shelf given over to Alice Monroe, I am absolutely going to bring it up. <laughs> right. Know, <laughs> yep. We're definitely going to go there right away. Now, tell me about <clears throat> the actual title. Uh, how does promiscuously <laughs> play in? I know it's a, it's a quote coming from Milton, but um, yeah. but tell me, what is books promiscuously read and how should we read promiscuously into the title? Well, I'm trying to remember now the process by which I found that. Title. Yeah, how long were you holding on to that phrase of Milton? Yeah, no, <laughs> I, I think actually I wasn't at all. I think what happened was I was thinking about. Well, first of all, I should say that my when I was writing this book, I played a little game with myself. And the rule of the game was I wasn't allowed to read anything for the book. Hmm. I was so which was it was essentially an anti scholarly impulse. I mean, one yeah. way to approach such a book is then to go make a bibliography of every other book about reading, of which there are many, 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 some of which I have read and are wonderful. Um and I thought, I'm not going to do that. What I want, I'm going to make this, I'm, I'm going to try and do what it says on the cover. I'm just going to make this book out of whatever occurs to me, what I'm reading at the time, what association pops into my mind. So if, if an association popped up and it was something that I hadn't read in a while, I absolutely did go back and reread it. Uh, but I didn't sit down and think, all right, you know, the, here are the things that absolutely have to be addressed if you're going to talk about this topic. So with Milton, I think... I, well, like I say, I really can't remember anymore, but it was, it was more like I was thinking about literary censorship or I was thinking about some issue and I thought, oh man, I haven't read Areopagitica in forever. So I went and read it and the phrase leapt out at me and I was just so delighted by it. I thought, oh, well, I, first of all, I didn't remember that at all. If you had told me that books promiscuously read was a phrase from Milton, I would have said you were nuts. Um, and then I thought, yeah, well, and obviously there's my title. <laughs> that's exactly Duh. that's just exactly what I'm talking about. So, and I and I loved the um, I loved I loved the sexual play of it too, which, so far as I can tell, was not at all on Milton's mind. But now, you know, there's no way to have the the word promiscuously in your in your title and not have that connotation. But I, I like that too because I thought my again my experience of reading is that it is a a whole self experience there are I, I can't think of many parts of myself that aren't or haven't been engaged at some point in my life as a reader and so i liked that sense of promiscuously as meaning both um without plan haphazard random and i also liked it as um sort of playful and contrarian, and I liked it as transgressive, as, um, you know, not obeying certain laws of propriety. And, you know, I, I just like the word for every reason. And uh, so I lifted it from Milton, and there it is. Nice. Now, when you talk about getting out of a, well, not wanting to do this as a an academic book, is that also part of the reason for the moving all the quotes, the, the annotations for the quotes to the back and not, <laughs> you know, weighing yeah. it. I was wondering if you're going to pull a David Shields, basically, and just leave everything in there with no attribution. And so people wouldn't know what was yours <laughs> and what was, you know, the wisdom of the ages. That's that would have been one option. But no, I, I could simply never have done that. I, I just it would have felt so wrong. Um, yeah, he's doubled down on that that perspective, and we've talked about it, and I'm sure we're going to talk about it again. But but yeah, anyway, no, it's a special it's, case. <laughs> I, I I will not judge him, but for me, no, I, I never could have done that. I mean, one thing that was going on was I had just finished ten years of editing Marianne Moore, and Marianne Moore made any number of her longest poems out of quotations of other people's work. They're just things that she found on advertisements in the newspapers remarks she overheard in conversation. I mean, she was just insatiable for little bits of other people's language. And she made endless records of these, and then she'd put them together and come up with a poem. So 
you know, one of her longest and best poems, an octopus is made up, half of it's just made up of stuff she found in a national park service brochure. And it's, it's incredible what she did with that. So I had a long period where I was being reinforced in the idea that that was a legitimate way to write. <laughs> I had, I had precedent. Um, but my, my stronger suspicion actually is that I didn't learn that from more. I think that's the way most of us who read all the time think anyway. Um, I think a lot of us who read all the time, our heads are just echo chambers. You know, there's, there's very few things in a day that happen to me that don't spark some little, you know, verbal association to a line of a poem or something in a novel or something like that. So I really did just want to mimic as best I could what it's like to be in my head as a reader, which is that, you know, a good half of what I think, I don't even know if I think it so much as these words are in my head and have taken up residence there. And as far as moving all the attribution to the back, that was just basically a pragmatic move. If I had put every attribution with every quotation, I mean, it would have yeah. been impossible to read. <laughs> you could that, never that, that was my it. thing. It makes the whole thing smoother. You yeah. know what's there. If it's something that intrigues you, you, you wait till the end of the paragraph, jump to the back of the book and see where it comes from. Well, exactly. And, and that was my hope. I, I, I thought on the one hand, this is going to be annoying to anybody who really wants to track down every quotation. But my hope was that actually people would give themselves permission to be promiscuous about that, you know, because <laughs> yeah. it really doesn't matter if I if I quote four words of David Foster Wallace. It, it probably doesn't actually matter so much if it's him who said it or someone else with obviously no disrespect to David Foster Wallace, unless that particular phrase really means something to you. And if it really means something to you, then of course you want to know. And of course yeah. you should know. And the irony being you did that in a book without footnotes. Yeah, well, so thank I, you. Thank <laughs> you very much. <laughs> you know, I did have when I was in that, there, there's a, a short section that deals with Wallace pretty closely. And yeah. I did for a long time plan to have one footnote. Yeah. And then I decided that having that little joke with myself really wasn't worth it. So I didn't do it. Finite jest. Yeah. That, that's... <laughs> <laughs> so you, you talked about the wanting to become a, an English professor, not for the, the, the research and archives mm -hmm. and life as a reader, but, but where did reading start mm -hmm. for you? And, <laughs> and when did you, we'll say graduate in terms of, you know, and I, I've got guests who've said they started reading War and Peace at like eight years old, and I always think that's bullshit, but that's either <laughs> here or there. But yeah, that, that, that well, sense maybe, of moving towards yeah. literature. But yeah. Right. I mean, maybe they did. I don't know. But no, I, yeah. I definitely didn't do anything like that. Um, I don't even think I was, I wasn't like a real prodigy of reading or anything. I, I learned to read at a totally average age of like five or six. Um, and then I started with completely average books. The first books that I can remember, well, first of all, I reread books as a child. I, I you know, I reread them to shreds. Like I reread mm -hmm. books until um, I knew them so well that I would start to having to just open at a random page to try and preserve any sense of surprise or any sense of engagement. And then when that didn't even work anymore, you know, I knew I, I had to put it aside for a while. So the first book that I can remember really doing that with is Anne of Green Gables. I read that thing. Well, there's, there is no, there's no way to estimate how many times I read it. Um, and I read you the read whole it to pieces. I yeah. did. Yeah. I read it to pieces. I still have the copy I read when I was 11. I think I was about 11 when I found it and it has, um, I mean, it's tattered and yellowed and, and fragile, but it also has, uh, all these little, holes in the, the pages because I, I used to write it lying on my floor in my bedroom and I had a parakeet who would be on the floor with me and <laughs> nibble on the pages while I read them. So I read, you know, I read that book until I couldn't read it no more. And um, I, I think it's probably, it, it's a good book to, to think about in this context because it did so much for me. So, so the first thing it did for me was it permanently etched a whole bunch of 19th century f actual phrases and locutions in my head. So well into high school, I was turning in papers 
with little, with like sentences that had structures that would come back with my teachers just like puzzled. They had no idea how I'd come up with something (laughs) this strange and this wrong. And I would think, but, but I'm sure that that's, I'm sure that can't be wrong. So, I I mean, it really did. um, And then, I mean, there's a million, say, indirect Bible quotations. So at the time I had no idea were from the Bible. Um, One of the characters, Mrs. Lind, uh, talks about uh, old Nick going to and fro and walking down, up and down the earth. And so there's just all this, all this cultural stuff that I had no idea I was imbibing and retaining that I absolutely was. Um, but, but probably more interestingly, interestingly than all that is why that story of the orphaned, um, super, super bright, odd duckling chatterbox and gets adopted into um, that household and then kind of becomes the object of their love and attention. Like, why why did that story speak so deeply to me? Why could I not get enough of that story? I don't know the answer to that question, um, but clearly it did. I mean, obviously that fed something in me that I didn't know needed to be fed. Um, that later, interestingly, I mean, it, within two years, the book that I was reading to pieces and, and just couldn't get enough of was Gone with the Wind. And, you know, you couldn't have a more different female heroine. Um, but I just, the, the story of Scarlett O'Hara, I was so, mainly I was outraged because she was such an awful person. I mean, I just, I was constantly in a state of fury that this person who was so horrible just kept winning and getting her way. Um, looking back as an adult, I think I was probably deeply envious that, you know, <laughs> someone who was just doing whatever she felt like and had no compunction was getting, getting everything she wanted. Um, so, uh, you know, there's another book that I was reading to shreds and probably because it was feeding something in me psychologically that I didn't know. Now I have very different relationships to both those books as an adult. I've gone back and read them both as an adult and Anne of Green Gables. I still love and adore though. I I see it as now I understand kind of, I understand it more as a period piece. Like I understand the context in which Ellen Montgomery was writing. And I went back and I read Gone with the Wind. And of course it's the most racist thing I've ever read in my life. I mean, just like jaw droppingly, breathtakingly. Um, So anyway, so uh, this is a very long way of saying, I think reading started as a way of meeting my own needs at a time when I not only had no idea what those needs were, but had no other way to meet them, which is another way of saying that I am sure that my obsessive focus on reading is as much as it's anything else, a sign of a wound or a lack. Uh, I think had I, had I had, ways to feed myself more directly if I hadn't needed to route it through fiction to even get close to what hurt me or or what I needed, you know, maybe, um, like maybe, maybe the fact that I need books so badly just shows that I am a little, uh, incomplete, (laughs) you know, I mean, I, I know plenty of kids who do not read obsessively. And often I look at those kids and I think, yeah, I think they just have it together more than I did. <laughs> like they, when they, when they feel sad or frightened, they know that that's what they feel. And they go and tell someone I feel sad or frightened. And that, that person responds to them. They don't have to go through this sort of elaborate side route. Well, we consider that cheating you and I. So. <laughs> exactly. Right, right, right. Yeah. I, I was going to say, cause you also characterize uh, a certain generation of male writing at, and male <laughs> readers, of course, you know, you didn't have baseball, masturbation, and comic books as mm. your 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 triple outlet, which mm. you know we unfortunately turn into the subject of a lot of literature. But you know, again, neither here nor there. No, I mean those are. I, I look. I um, big baseball I, fan. I'm just kidding. I, I, <laughs> I, no, I, I hate baseball. I have zero interest in it. But you know, when Don DeLillo gets it, like I can't put the book down, and I'm let's say not hugely interested in male masturbation, but I do read Philip Roth every couple of years. I sort of read him from beginning to end. So it's not that those are bad preoccupations. I just think that there's an in, there's an imbalance there. Um, Favorite Roth? 
Oh, that, well, that's an easy question. Yeah. Uh, it's Sabbath theater. I mean, that's the uh, based on where the conversation led to Roth. I was assuming that was going to be it, <laughs> yeah, but... no, Sabbath theater is, is the book yeah. he was always meant to write. It's the book that justifies his whole career. Like that's, if you write that book, then you are allowed my, to have written anything else you want. Well, my, my thesis is that all of the subsequent novels are after effects of Sabbath theater. Every one of them yeah. carries a thread of that novel within yeah. it that he basically seeded the second half of, or the last third of his career with that big one. You know, I think that's probably true. I, the only, there's a lot of late Roth that like most people, I'm, I'm not that excited about. Um, but I do think that nemesis is an extraordinary book. Yeah. And I'm an every man fan. I, I go back to that one. Uh, because yeah? I, I'm an old Jew who's going to die. So, you know, that's, that's <laughs> <laughs> I would read it every year for a while and then and started to get, you know, as I approached 50, it was, hey, maybe I should slack back on this a little bit. But you know, um, I did bring it when I, I went to Roth's grave finally. Um, oh, did you? Gosh, 2019, after uh, uh -huh. interviewing Daniel Mendelssohn up near Bard College, I said, is it tough to find? He's like, no, no, let me tell you in general. And then once you get there, you'll figure it out. So I, I took a picture with a every man and my first edition of Portnoy's Complaint. Um, mm -hmm on it and then realized um if he was not cremated which he was not then i was pretty much standing on his crotch when i took the picture <laughs> uh you know six feet up and which Very again nice. makes sense in, in a rothian world so you know um but yeah i have to revisit some of the well my conversations with vivian gornick last or early this year kind of tweaked mm. my my roth thing I'm, I'm thinking about him in more more problematic ways nowadays but not related not to the Blake all. bailey stuff but but yeah, it's um, times change and things change. Mm -hmm. But uh, speaking of, of that, though, you w well, a phenomenon you bring up in the book, which has been a, an ongoing preoccupation for me, is the books that somehow got better as we got older. <laughs> uh, yeah, a lot of those. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you have a either, you know, book that you've been reading repeatedly that, you know, wow, this is so much better than I thought it was when I was 20 yeah. or something you're thankful you didn't read when you were younger? I always use The Leopard by uh, Lapidusa uh -huh. as mine. I, I read it at 40 something. Had I read it 10 years earlier when I bought it, I wouldn't have gotten it. As a 30 something guy, I would have not grasped the midlifery and everything yeah, else that, sure. that came to me. Um, but how about you? I certainly don't think I ruined any book by reading it too early. Uh, Cause I'm pretty, I'm pretty willing to retake up a book that didn't work for me before. So I mm -hmm. like having read it early and not had much response is, is not much of an impediment to me to pick it up again. So I don't think that was so much as a problem, a problem. Um, I would say, well, just right now, as a matter of fact, I am trying to reread portrait of a lady and I'm a, a massive Henry James head. I also, do a, well, I mean, nobody has read all of Henry James, <laughs> but, but I, I, I do reread the greatest hits every few years. And so I'm trying to reread a portrait of a lady. And I say I'm trying because when I read, I put little, um, little, uh, translucent post-it sticky flags next to anything I want to make a note of mm -hmm. just anything that strikes me as interesting or pertinent. And so I'm reading this book and every page is so thick with those tags that I just can't make any progress. It's like, and then I go to, you know, enter them in my, in my notes and I'm just basically transcribing the book because every page is so rich with, with things that I, I feel like I absolutely have to remember. And although that's a book that I've read many times and I've certainly liked many times, this is the first time that I've ever had this reaction to it where just every paragraph has something that is so painfully perceptive, just so dead on that I, I, I essentially have to stop. It, I just have to sit there and absorb the impact of it. So for whatever reason, that's, that's a book that's changed for me recently, kind of to my surprise. As a compulsive reader, did you lose focus last year? <laughs> uh I mean, those early months. 
you yeah, know, March, sure. April, May. Sure. Yeah. I don't remember, honestly. I, I really don't I was remember. stuck. I was flat out yeah, stuck for like I, a month I know, plus. So, I know yeah. a lot of people did. I was actually just talking to my aunt last night who said that she basically hasn't read in a year and she loves to read and she just hasn't done it. And I said, my suspicion was that she was just tired. <laughs> this, yeah. this gets into something I talk about a little in the book. I think, you know, when you, when you love to do something, when, when doing it is kind of nothing but a pleasure, it's easy not to realize how much energy it also takes. And I think reading takes a lot of energy. And most of us, if we really like to do it, we don't even notice because it's a pleasure and, and a habit, like we're used to it. But, but certainly with something like the pandemic, I think a lot of people are just exhausted. I mean, I, I was exhausted, but that exhaustion showed itself in other ways. It didn't actually interfere with my reading, but it doesn't surprise me at all that a lot of people stopped reading. I mean, reading just requires... It requires everything we didn't have, you know? Yeah, the focus it, it, and concentration. And, and, yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, just all the things that had been pulled out from under us, that's what reading needs. So even though we know that reading for a purpose or a moral end is is a dead end, what do you want readers to to get out of books read promiscuously? Or books promiscuously read. I always screw that up. BPR. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting because when you said it, what do you want – readers to get out of books read promiscuously, I assumed you meant all the other books they're yeah. reading. <laughs> the title. Oh, no, no, out of my book. Um, I, I wrote it to encourage people not to feel bad about reading because I cannot tell you how often I hear people who love to read say some version of, Oh, yeah. I mean, I love reading novels, but it just makes me feel so guilty. So I haven't read one in three years. Or, yeah, I read a review of this book that came out. It sounds so interesting. So I'm hoping that in six months, I'll have time to take a look at it. And I mean, these things just appall me. They, they really make me both want to shake people and weep. Um, you know, I measure the time between I heard about a book I want to read and I think I'm going to read it in like, you know, Amazon delivery days or <laughs> hours before I can yeah. get to the library. Any, any wait longer than that is, is unacceptable. So anyway, I, I just thought that, you know, it's a delicate thing because on the one hand, lots of people have very, very good reasons not to read. You know, even people who really like reading, they've got lives, they have things that come between them and their books. And so, you know, I don't want to scold anybody for not reading. It's, it's your life. Do, do what you need to do. But I definitely wanted to encourage people who limit their own reading out of a sense of somehow of like guilt that because it's such a pleasure, it must also not be the right thing to do. Like that I, I wanted to write against. That's what I wanted to stamp out. I wanted to give them a book that they could look at on their shelf and think, okay, I'm feeling a little guilty, but Heather White thinks I shouldn't. She <laughs> thinks I should go read that novel. So maybe I'll go sit down and, and read it. But not the recognitions. I'm just kidding. I, I... <laughs> no, no, no. That's your pleasure. You, you go ahead. I, I admire you. Yeah, it was a, uh, well, it was another one of those challenges that was actually post-college, but, but well, actually, that's the, the 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 question about graduating in in books. Did you have a person slash mentor who kind of fed you the the good stuff as you got into your teens, um, or gave you signposts or, or directions? Let me think about that. Because um, there was an English teacher, plus there were comics that like certain writers of comics made references to Pynchon, et cetera, that kind of mm -hmm, started mm -hmm. opening me up when I was 15, 16, 17. Yeah. But I have no idea what normal people, <laughs> as though either of us were normal, uh, you know, experiences. Yeah, that I, I wouldn't know either. Um, I had, you know, I, I'm going to say this about myself, and I'm not sure that this is a good thing. Like, I'm, I don't... This, well, whatever. It is what it is. Um, I, I think in my reading, as in just about all other areas of my life, I've always had a certain kind of competitiveness. 
Like if I had, you know, if I got wind that there was something that people thought was really good, hmm. I mean, certainly I wanted to read it because I might like it, but also I didn't want to miss out. So, you know, any hint in the ether that say Jane Austen was someone you should read, I was definitely on it. I don't remember, you know, having a particular person, um, there may well have been, and I, I you know, I, I'm probably doing a real disservice to the teachers I had. Um, They're probably going to call me afterwards angry. Yeah, but, I know, okay. I know. <laughs> I mean, I, well, let's say I do remember in um, AP English in my senior year, my teacher who gave me Emily Dickinson. I think that was the first time I'd ever read Emily Dickinson. And when she took us through these two poems and I saw how much attention you could pay to just like say 20 words, you know, I was hooked. That was, that was a real big moment. So there's, um, there's my, my high senior high school English teacher whose name is, oh shoot. You anyway. gotta have it. I had Joe Blake who turned me on to Calvino and, and bought me a couple a copy of Invisible Cities, but you know, that's a separate Eileen direction. Eileen Tunick, Miss Eileen Tunick. She's very nice. a very, very cool lady. Anyway, so I did have that. Um, but mostly, you know, you know how it is. I mean, you just follow your nose. Like you read one book and then all of a sudden there's all these others that seem to kind of come up. <laughs> yeah. You think, oh, yeah, I should read that. Or So I don't yeah. know. I don't remember. That's been my weird, what would I be reading if it weren't for the podcast? Because so much of my mm. reading is for the, the guests. And I just. Oh, you know, I. Yeah, yeah, that that is really interesting. So I was just thinking, so you are in more or less exactly the same bind I described as an English teacher. I was, was going to say, because you you yeah, have things you course. have to read. And, right, and, right. You have made your, your avocation, your vocation in a sense. Yeah, so you're reading a lot of, you're doing a lot of assigned reading is what I would say. And that's, yeah. that's actually a I, very I don't, I don't hard like thing think to of do. It. Don't, I don't think of it in a, a derogatory way, but yeah, yeah, no, I'm with you. Because yeah. so, when you look over my list of every book I finished, which I've been keeping since 1989, because I'm competitive, like you, <laughs> uh, <laughs> there are a whole lot of them that are, you know, check out my podcast with Person X. Yeah. But you know, at the same time, it was just, uh, I guess, a year and a half. Everything is a blur now. It had to be two years ago. Um, Amor Tolls turned me on to John Le Carre's Smiley novels, and mm -hmm. I was never going to get a podcast with with Le Carre, and still managed to just I'm just going to keep reading these compulsively through the winter of I guess 2019. Good for you. I went kind of Love bananas it. with those, but. And then there's rereading Anthony Pohl's Dance of the Music of Time because, once again, I want to do something that I can lord over other people. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that, that question of, like, what would you read if this wasn't your your job job? Yeah, I would read exactly what I'm reading. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I got to say this. I, um, what I read for my job, uh, let me think about that. I mean, of course, it's not quite true. Like, I'm, I'm teaching an introduction to American literature, Civil War to the Present, this coming fall. So I am rereading a lot of people that I, I might not otherwise be rereading at the moment. But, say, one of those people is Willa Cather. And I first read Willa Cather not because I was a scholar of American literature and I needed to fill out my uh, my my history, but because I was procrastinating on something else I had to read and I just found her on a shelf and I thought, oh, heck, you know, I'll read Willa Cather instead. And she turned out to be a genius and I love her. So, I mean, in some sense, you know, I'm, I'm reading Willa Cather because I'm teaching, but in another sense, I am here because things happen to me. Like I pick up Willa Cather randomly and then I get completely drawn in. And before I know it, you know, I've read all of Willa Cather. Yeah, are you that much of a, a completist with, with authors? Uh, not programmatically. No. Um, there are plenty of writers about whom I'm, I'm not complete though. I am, I guess, mildly, uh, I guess just sort of mildly obsessive is probably the right way to put it. So. <laughs> oh, I don't think mildly is the appropriate term here, but, but go on. Yeah, That's it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not opposed at all. Like I don't, if you tell me that I have to sit down and read everything that somebody wrote, like I don't really get a sinking feeling in my stomach. I think, okay, more, yeah, how much time do I have? Yeah. Right, exactly. That's, that's probably a good project. 
<laughs> so how have students changed? And I'm, I'm um, not sure how long you've been teaching, teaching, but. Well, yeah, I got my, I teach at the University of Alabama. I started here in My wife went to LSU, by the way. She left the house when I told ah! her I was interviewing somebody from <laughs> Alabama. So it's a big anti-Sabin focus here. But, yeah. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah, no, that rivalry is insane. I, yeah. I, I, I learned all this, you know, de novo when I, when I moved here. Um, but yeah, the LSU, that is a bitter rivalry. Anyway, um, so I, I got, this was my first tenure track job. I started in 2000. So I'd been teaching as a graduate student and an instructor for maybe five years before that. So let's say I've had 25 years, 26 years now teaching um, students of literature. I can't tell that they've changed at all. I mean, the, the incidentals change a lot. The technology obviously is transformative. Um, the demographics of the students that I've taught has changed unrecognizably um, for reasons specific to my institution, but, but teaching them in general is no different from what it ever was, um, which is to say an enormous pleasure. <laughs> I yeah. really, really, really love teaching. Yeah, it's, it's great. Is it the sense of, of common foundation of literature is that shifted at all? I again, I went to Hampshire where the whole idea was there is no commonality for anything, and we're all in that Harold yeah. Bloomian <laughs> school of resentment. So I went to right, St. John's right. College for the the antidote uh, uh, after that for two yeah, years. And, boy, uh, you really did. Yeah, literally um, uh, one eighty, but you know it, it prepared me in a weird way. So it's but, just yeah, the, you know, t I mean, teaching essentially combines my two favorite things, which is talking about books and talking to people. <laughs> what, what, what could possibly be better? Um, and I think there's a lot of things. I, I love the role of being oftentimes one of the people the students have met who is the most interested in reading. Like they have, you know, they've often, yeah. they've of course had other wonderful teachers besides me, but it, it's wonderful to be in that category of being the person who doesn't think it's nerdy or strange at all, who in fact thinks like, you know, when somebody says, Oh, I think you're reading too much into it. I'm thinking you are not reading nearly enough into it. You know, we're going <laughs> to, yeah. we're going to stay here for another hour if I have my way to say that. So I, 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 I adore that role. Um, I love being able to help people into books that they think they don't like, but in fact, they just haven't found a way into, mm -hmm. you know, when people confront a book and they find it confusing or intimidating, it's sort of a natural human reaction to go, Oh, I don't like that book or even worse. I don't like reading or horribly. I don't like poetry. And so it's, it's just such a pleasure to be in a position to intervene in that, um, that chain reaction and say, Oh wait, stop. I'll bet it isn't that you don't like it. And I'll, I'm sure it's not that you don't like the whole category. It's just that you haven't found a path yet and I can help you. That's, that's what I do. So just don't worry about it. Don't relax. Don't judge yourself. Don't judge the book. Let's just stay here a while and see if we can't find a way in. And once you're in, I think, you know, then you can decide if you don't like it or you do like it or whatever it is. Is there a particular book that, that, fits that category for a lot of people uh -huh. in your experience? Well, I teach poetry. So pretty much everything uh, I teach, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nobody, 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 want, nobody ever comes to my course because they want to take it. They usually come, I say nobody, most, most students don't, aren't there because they want to take my course. They're there because it fulfills a requirement and it fills a time slot they needed. And I actually enjoy that challenge too, very much. I mean, I know that most of them they feel bad about it and they're sort of trying to hide from me that they, they're not there because they chose it. But I know that, and that's completely fine. I, I enjoy the challenge of saying, well, as long as you're here, as long as you have to be here, why don't we see if we can have a good time? The book that I teach a lot that people need the most help into, but then get the most out of once they're there is James Merrill's poem, the book of Ephraim. Yeah. Uh, which is a 26 poem sequence. And uh, I mean, I don't have to tell you, uh, is dense and strange and full of, I mean, it's so chock full of cultural references that most of us don't have that. I mean, there's a million reasons that poem can be very, very, very difficult for students to get into. 
But I find that once I give them ways into it, they go kind of nuts. You know, once they get a sense, they sort of find their feet, they begin to see how much fun it is, basically. You know, not just how rich it is, but how kind of hilarious and strange and sad and beautiful it is. So I, I always really enjoy that. I always say to them, like, do not feel bad. I know you're going to read this. You're going to make nothing of it. You're just going to feel like giving up, but just stay with me. We're going to get there together. And we usually do. So I'll have to take you up when I finally dive into Merrill. I, I, I interviewed Lincoln Hammer. Have you Lincoln not dived Hammer. into Merrill yet? Dude. Oh, I'm a poetry moron, which is uh, exactly <laughs> who you're describing. And Look, I have yeah, a, I mean... the bigger embarrassment of, I, I've never read Marianne Moore. So I need you to, to help me uh, 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 where to start and, and, and tell me what I'm yeah. missing out on. But Well, but I, that, I mean, yeah, yeah. Moore and Merrill is sort of diving into the deep end. Those are not easy. Oh, I know. <laughs> not easy poets to read about somebody holding your hand. Well, that was the when I, I interviewed Langdon Hammer for the the Merrill bio. Yeah, he had enough of Merrill of Merrill's poetry in the book and yes. how it you know how how it came together that I felt like yeah. okay, I'm getting a, an introduction to to Merrill here. The problem was I read one chapter a day, which when I told Lenny <laughs> this, he freaked out. He's like, that that took me 14 years. I'm like, yeah, well, yeah, I had yeah, a deadline, no, that's, so <laughs> that's that's an insane pace at which to read that book. That's for sure. <laughs> it was it was a wonderful experience. It was actually my first visit to Yale. Oh. Um, the only other one I had was our, our shared experience at, at uh, Harold Bloom's memorial um, yeah. right before pandemia struck. Mm -hmm. but, I know. Yeah, that was that was something. Tell me about your your Bloom. Did you study under him? I did. Study I, with him? I, I, I went to, to Yale. Um, yeah. I started at Yale in 1988 and I graduated in 1992. And as a sophomore, I took I don't remember now which of Bloom's courses it was. It was probably Introduction to Romantic Literature or something. It was, you know, it was one of the ones he teaches every year. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I responded very, very, very strongly to Harold Bloom. Um, he, for me, was one of the first he was one of the first people I'd ever really met who, I don't know how to put this, but who read with this kind of total freedom. Like Harold came to books and first of all, you know, dove in as deeply as it was possible to go. Like nobody read a book. Um, more penetratingly than Harold, but he also did not care what anyone thought of his <laughs> reading. And, you know, I mean, obviously that, well, whatever, there's a zillion things to go into about Harold Bloom, but I won't. Um, but in my limited partial experience, I mean, the thing that hit me like a freight train when I, when I took that class was here was someone like, here was a way of reading. Here was a model for how you could read, like really, really, really read well and deeply and freely. And I found that enormously liberating as, as a model. Um, and then I took, I took more courses with him. I, you know, I, I knew him personally. Um, certainly by the time I was in graduate school, I was close to not only him, but to his family. Um, and I mean, collectively, the family was very important to me and very, very generous to me. Um, so I, I had, I think, I, well, I don't know if it's unusual or not, but, but my experience of Harold was enormously important to me, um, and particularly in a way as a reader. Yeah. Do you know if you read your, your more? Uh, he blurped it. <laughs> oh, good. good. Okay. <laughs> so whether, I don't know, you know, whether or not he read a word of it, I couldn't tell you, but, uh. Well, you know him, he could, probably could have gotten through it in the course of a night because. Yeah, you know, exactly. He could have blinked his way through it. Yeah. Harold being Harold. It was the, uh, uh, I would say among the more intimidating slash most intimidating, uh, leading into sitting down with him for the, the show. Yeah, but, with that, yeah, I can imagine. But I did the. Uh, the due diligence of asking uh, a couple of his pals what I should do to to try to kind of get him out of 
the Bloom persona. And they all said, oh, that's not going to work, Gil. Just you're there for the ride. Yes. <laughs> Just ask yeah. a couple of questions and, and let Harold be Harold. I'm like, yeah. yeah, that's that's probably for the best. I I was going to ask about baseball, but I figure, yeah, let's let's just, you know, no, start with poetry true. and see where he goes from there. But but yes, it was it was quite a ride. But uh, I once uh, I once yeah. asked him, he was at the end of some long discourse on something or other. And I said, Harold, have you ever had a thought that you didn't say? <laughs> He looked at me and said, wicked child, bad, wicked child. <laughs> uh, I had reached out to him many, many years ago when I was, oh God, I had to be in the 90s when I was a small press publisher. I was um, looking to reissue Pater's Plato and Platonism and uh, mm. and just called the switchboard at Yale and they connected me to him. Well, I, to this day, don't understand why they did that, but um, they, <laughs> they went ahead and did. And, and he was charitable, but but made a very funny and self-effacing comment about why he couldn't, which I just thought he is living up to every stereotype I had about how this phone call would go. So I'm I'm yep. perfectly fine with this. And, you know, yeah, he always did deliver that way. Well, let me ask, as long as we're talking about mortality books and, and, yeah. and everything else, um, as my listeners, who God knows how many there actually are, know, I... I had a, a leukemia diagnosis recently. Turns out to be stage zero. I should be around for a bazillion years, um, <laughs> provided things don't go awry. But in my worst case scenario, before I got my diagnosis, I was looking around my library and thinking, if I had six months, mm -hmm. what am I reading? What am I doing? I mean, the books themselves, I know my wife can dispose of, and, and I've got a few that are, you know, the special ones. Um, like getting Harold to sign a copy of the one novel that he wrote, which he was very angry when I, I put it in front oh, of him. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Boy, uh, Good for you uh, for knowing about it and having it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I brought up a stack that, that day, and, and yeah, he was <laughs> – that was the one he glared at me for. But sure. he wasn't embarrassed about writing it. He was embarrassed about publishing it, I think he, mm -hmm. he said. But, but, but if you knew you were on the way out, <laughs> what would matter to you to read or to reread? Is there anything have, that you haven't read? Uh, no, I have no idea how I would feel under those circumstances. Because I would yeah. say the the essence of reading promiscuously, as I understand it, is essentially not to ask yourself that kind of question. It's never yeah. to pick up a book and think, oh, but is it meaningful enough? I mean, except in the most casual way. Like if you pick up a book and it's not engaging you, then by all means, put it down. Sure. Um, so I have no special insight into that because that's not a situation I've ever faced. And I have no, I, I have no opinion about it. I, I and I, though I, I do think it's, it's a really important question to ask in relation to the book because it, my book, that is to say, yeah. I, I contemplated it in relation to your book over the last <laughs> couple of days. So I'll put it that way because it's still, echoing it's, in my head. So, well, yeah. it's a, I mean, oh, it's an endless question, but let's say this. I think there's nothing a lifetime of reading can give you that will replace, say, a year with a really good therapist <laughs> or, uh, I don't know, the habit of taking a walk every day or reconciling with your brother or, you know, I mean, there's a million things that will enrich and enhance your life and your self-knowledge and all kinds of things that reading cannot do for you. And it's really, really important not to confuse what you're doing when you're reading with what you're doing in any number of the aspects of your other aspects of your life. Um, for example, if, I don't know, you're interested in meditation, it will not do to sit down and read every book written on meditation. Like that will not do anything for you that actually sitting down and meditating will do. On the other hand, I think there's nothing that can do what reading does for you except reading. So just because reading can't do everything for you and just because it can't do some very, very important things for you doesn't mean that what it can do for you isn't unique and valuable. So this is where I wanted to encourage a an attitude of like total insouciance. Don't read as if you were going to die because that's too much pressure and it's going to just mess up all the choices you make. Because the choices you make should in some sense, 
you shouldn't even really know that you're making them. I mean, I say should. I think usually when when you're reading in the way that I think of as, you know, engaged and deep, you're not really making conscious choices. You're just following your nose. And I think that's that's very much for the best. Um, so but, you know, if you have that kind of pressure, like <laughs> I only have six weeks to live, then my intuitive answer is, oh, my God, stop reading. Like, go spend every day with your child or <laughs> I yeah. don't know what it is, but like. No, I mean, definitely, if you've got a few weeks to live, the last thing. Well, we'll say six months instead of six weeks. That's a, a yeah. longer term. And it's the, the side question. Do you keep buying books? Uh-huh. I would, you know, again, how do I know? How do I know about any of this? I have zero idea. <laughs> yeah, I feel I horrible would... planting all this in your head now, but it is a no, human No, no, it's, it's, <laughs> it's not bad. It's just that I don't know. I mean, I, I think yeah. none of us know how we would respond under this kind of circumstances. It's probably in ways that would totally surprise me. But again, my impulse is to say, you know, in my, in my ideal, you wouldn't do anything differently at all. Like if, if I am all reading, I'm already, as far as I know, reading the way I think it's best for me to read. So given that, um, if I knew I only had six months left, oh my God, I mean, well, first of all, yeah, I probably would focus more on people than on books, but, but we'll honestly, I, I, well, <laughs> <laughs> who knows? Like, let's hope I don't ever have to, yeah, or let's I know, hope I, I don't know. soon have to face that. Um, but, but yeah, I don't know that I would do anything differently because again, well, here's, I mean, here's, here's a better answer. I don't think under those circumstances, it would even much matter what you're reading because I think your response to your reading would be conditioned by your life. So whether you're having a response, you know, if you have six months to live and you pick up Anna Karenina or you pick up, um, I don't even know what, um, you know, you pick up a, a book written a, a month ago and it's on the bestseller list, but you've never heard of the person or like probably what you pick up matters less than what you're bringing to it. And, um, Though, well, whatever. This is an endlessly complicated question because yeah, I do think, sorry. You know, like, there are differences <laughs> between books, but no, I, you know what, Gil? I'm just going to say, like, stop it. You have six months to live. Like, seriously, go tell the people you love you love them. Eat and drink whatever you want, and don't worry about your reading so much. Okay, but I should read Marianne Moore, right? Ah, I mean, I think you can. <laughs> Without having read Mary and Moore, I think you, I think you can die without reading anything at all and have lived a perfectly good life. I'm hip, but we'll take that as a, a last question, though, for someone who's embarrassed to admit he's never read her. Where do I start, and what am I, uh. I missing out on? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, this this our, this is <laughs> this touches on a larger issue, which is, as I say somewhere in the book. Um, it's a big dilemma being an English teacher in my experience, because on the one hand, I have a zillion books that I think are great. And I think, oh, that's a great book. My students should read that book. But first of all, the minute I assign it to them, I've already basically killed it. Like nobody wants to read something that's assigned. It's very hard to get engaged in something you have to read. So by the mere fact of my putting it on a syllabus, I've already greatly diminished the chances that they'll respond to it the way I hope. The other thing is that the minute I try to teach something I really deeply love, either I objectively am a worse teacher or I just feel like such a worse teacher of it that it's pretty aversive. It's very, I've, I rarely feel that I have done a good job teaching things that I, I really, really love. So what should you read with Marianne Moore? Okay, you should go in with a very patient attitude toward yourself and poetry. <laughs> you should understand that it's not you. She is, in fact, a very strange poet, and it is going to take a while for you to kind of get in the groove of what she's up to. Um, but you should start with her animal poems. You should read the Jerboa. You should read... Uh, half deity you should read maybe you should read an octopus maybe not and it's not actually about an octopus it's about an iceberg um try her long animal poems those are the ones that really kind of made her reputation 
and then, you know, call me. <laughs> I'll yeah. hold your hand. I'll calm you down and we'll, so what we'll the figure it out What the hell is together. going on here? Yeah. <laughs> And I, I guess as a, a bonus last question, what drew you to more to begin with? Ugh. Which I know should have been an early question if we were talking no, in 2017 um, when the Collected New Poems came out. But but yeah, yeah. No, you know, what happened there was I had always, I'd always really liked more. I mean, I, I am endlessly interested in what she did because what she did is so strange and particular and no one's ever really done it again. And I mean, there's a lot of reasons why she's, she's an interesting poet, but truly what got me going in that case was that her, for, you know, reasons that it would take a whole other podcast to yeah. go into her work needed dire editorial. I mean, it was in imminent need of, of editorial intervention. Um, somebody had to get in there and do something about the state of Marianne Moore. And, you know, for a whole bunch of serendipitous reasons, it turned out I was that person. You know, I, I had, I had the right skill set. I had the right interest. It was, the timing was good. Um, you know, it, it all just sort of came together. So I didn't spend 10 more, 10 years, 10 more, God, I didn't spend 10 <laughs> years on more really out of, love of more so much as out of my sense that something had to be done and it had to be done right. It had to be done thoroughly. It had to be done in a way that it wouldn't need to get redone in a few years. And it just took that long to, to get it done that way. So I propose our in-person podcast if you're ever up in the New York, New Jersey area, or if my wife ever lets me actually get to Alabama, given the, the LSU <laughs> thing, we sit, we sit down and talk poems and poetry. Oh, God, uh, I would I'll, love to do that. Okay. Oh, I would love to do that. That would be wonderful. Awesome. It's a date. Heather, thanks so much for coming on. This has been a blast, and I enjoyed the hell out of books promiscuously read as opposed to books read promiscuously, which <laughs> defines both of our lives. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gil. I had a ball, too. And that was Heather Cass White. Her lovely new book is Books Promiscuously Read, Reading as a Way of Life, from FSG. It really is a joy to, to experience the writing of someone for whom books mean so much and, and who imparts that joy so well. It really makes me jealous of her students. But anyway, Heather is not on social media, as near as I can tell, and as we all know, that's for the best. Uh, it really just it destroys a lot of our time and our best writing and reading. But but anyway, in addition to books promiscuously read, I did follow through on my promise from the conversation and have ordered new collected poems, the addition to Marianne Moore's work that Heather edited. I will let you know when I have slowed down enough to to spend time with some poems. Now, in the meantime, you can support the Virtual Memories Show by um, telling other people about it. You can also tell me what you think of the show. Uh, you can send me postcards, letters, emails. You can leave a message on my Google Voice number, which is 973-869-9659. And I'd love to know what you like, what you don't like uh, about the podcast, who you'd like to hear me record with, um, what movie or TV show or book or, or piece of music or comic or whatever you think I should turn listeners on to. Now, if you've got money or resources to spare, then I hope you'll help support individuals and, and institutions in need. And you can find individuals through GoFundMe, Patreon, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, etc. Um, if you're looking to some, for somewhere to start with institutions, um, there's your local food bank, the Poor People's Campaign, Freedom Funds, Election Funds. There are a lot of things you can do to, to try to help build a better world. So I hope you will. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. 
You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at VMSPod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. 